Hi, this is Paul. I want to do a little video about what I've been reflecting on now being on YouTube in a more serious way for about four years, and that's the churn. Now, now churning is a term that you hear used often of streaming services. They try to not just have you subscribe to Disney Plus to see The Mandalorian, but for you to stay on the channel. So they're constantly trying to have new material that will keep you there because they're worried about the churn. The cell phone providers in the United States use the same term because they don't want people switching from one network to the other. Um, they want to sort of keep you in. So they're trying to avoid the churn. One of the real differences that I've seen of being on YouTube versus in, let's say, church work is, in fact, the churn. I, I do try to pay as close attention to my comments as I can because, of course, I learn and glean a tremendous amount from you. But in four years, one of the things that, that I have learned on YouTube is just the churn. And I watch myself churning on YouTube. There's times when certain channels have my attention and so at times when certain people lose my attention. It, it's these, these um, what, what are we to each other in this strange world? It's very different from how, it's very different. It's difficult to categorize how we are and how it's different from how we are in meat space or physical space. Now, um, Hans-Georg Mueller has a, another video on profilicity with this capturing thumbnail of is Kamala Harris authentic? And of course, that grabs all sorts of things. But one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is that it's not been that long since we've been watching ourselves watch ourselves. You know, of course, mirrors and reflections have been around a, long, a fairly long time, but not terribly common before necessarily the Industrial Revolution. And then once photography and phonography came on, we began to see images of ourselves, these little moments captured in time. And once we see ourselves in this way, we can't help but think about ourselves through those pictures. And we think about each other through those pictures. And so this is this is changing us and it's changing who we are and how we relate. Newspapers of course sort of brought created news as such what we have today where we sort of collectively see ourselves and see each other through this media of of these profiles and these images and these snapshots and these these little compressed narratives I, that P video with Jordan Peterson and th another guest talking about the psychology of narrative that was a I thought a quite a profound conversation I'm going to have to listen to that a couple of more times it really captured me but it, it just really continued to give me the sense of how narrative is sort of the, not only this power, powerful compression engine but but really in many ways, a good tell into what cognition is beneath the surface in some ways. I'm really, I really want to hear John Verveke's take on that conversation because I know he's been quite skeptical of narrative and skeptical of the overuse of narrative. So I'd love to see John engage with, with that um, individual that Jordan was engaging with. And, and, and this has done nothing but sped up. So, you know, partly what I've been doing lately is, you know, watching some of the channels that watch me because maybe it's egotism that I just want to see myself and I, I love to hear myself mentioned, but, but it's also just, just trying to find out what this avatar out there on the internet is doing. There are times sometimes when I, Jordan Peterson talked about this after he came back from his convalescence and he said, you know, my avatars have been out there. And and sometimes after I, if I'm walking through the day, I think about the video that I released in the morning and I think there's a, there's a me out there talking to you. And, and for you, it's, it's in many ways, the only me you sort of know, but it's a, a flat me. This is. I have some conversations that I've done 
uh, some two, two really good randos conversations today that uh, one for one definitely will be shared. We'll see if the other is shared, but you know, it just prompts me thinking about this this the churning because I and as well as people I watch on YouTube, I mean, I'm participating in this too. You know, and and part of why I started doing my channel the way I've been doing it is I've sort of been talking back to these avatars. And I've been relating to these avatars relationally in a strange way. Now, now they're, of course, not the people that they are. Uh, I posted today's video, some commentary on the Audrey Assad deconstruction testimony. And, you know, she responded to me in Twitter, which was, which was lovely. But I always try to keep in mind that there are, there are people behind these images and there are people with feelings and with concerns and with, you know, I often say that YouTube is a place for people with little to lose. You know, people that that have things to lose, and so in, in some ways, you know, Grim always has virtually not alone and, and the bottom runner of his channel. And, uh, in what ways are we not alone, and in, in what ways are we are, are we talking to the machines? So we have these these this cycle of profilicity. We are inhabiting the space between multiple personas, cycling through contexts, and then these avatars, these images, these recordings are doing the same. And you know, people then for a time get invested in my channel because it somehow intersects with other things in their life, and they'll watch. And of course, I put out a lot of content. So if they if they want to listen to or watch a lot of me, they'll do so until they've I've sort of become map territory, and then they move on, and then maybe they come back, or or maybe they're upset, or and and it, it's just an exceedingly strange thing. I, I couldn't find the clip of Peugeot talking about media as sort of this hyper attention and but i did find this this clip of of he and verveke talking about some of this on their recent thing with angels and i i do worry that we are running this grand social experiment with social media and with phones on ourselves and the next generation there's already some preliminary evidence that's having an impact, and we don't know what this is going to do. Like it, we're doing something that is 10 times more powerful than the printing press, and the printing press unle unleashed forces that then turned to bloody religious war in yeah. Europe in an unforeseen fashion. And, and so we, like, I, 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 don't, I do not think we are exercising proper care around this. That's for sure. <laughs> nobody nobody gets too big. It is like, yeah. uh, you know, when we talk about this is when I look at the internet and I look at social media, it's the closest thing I have to understanding a, a kind of a, how can I say this, a God acting in the world in the sense that yeah. like a, you know, like a pagan deity that is yeah. embodied in ritual and in practice and, and in, you know, nodes of attention because it's just, there's no one controlling it, yes. but it still it's seems to have a will and seems to be going towards a telos and everybody sees it and nobody can stop it. And everybody says, well, at least I'm going to get what I can get as I watch this, this God yeah. kind of move towards its sacrifice or whatever's going on. But everybody's like, well, at least I can get something out of it while it's happening. I, I think that's a very apropos way of thinking of it. Um, um, I, I, I often use Thomas Merton's idea of a hyper object. Uh, and that, that, and um, and, and Mer Mort no, not Merton, Morton, Morton, Thomas Morton, I'm, 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 I misspoke. Yeah, I was surprised uh, that he would have a term like that. No, no, no. Thomas no. Merton would have a term like I, hyper object. object. Sorry. Uh, a, 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 um, a Trappist monk who, who vowed silence. Uh, and so Morton's idea in hyper objects is that there are things like, you know, uh, the internet, global warming, evolution. Uh, they're realities, but they don't, they, they're not, they're not like bodies. They're not spatially, temporally located. They're distributed, right? And, and, and we can't actually sort of conceive of them. Uh, it, like we can have terms referring to them, but we can't sort of, if you allow me a science fiction reference, we can't grok them. We can't sort of really get. Uh, and so we, we uh, but, the, but they're not abstract things over there, right? They're, they're, they're insinuating themselves into the, the very fiber of our being. Um, yeah, they have so, more subtle bodies to use, uh, to use a religious term. <laughs> Yeah, and and uh, I'm 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 fine with that, and and you see a a, sim, uh, a similar kind of move in later Neoplatonism, where Proclus and the elements of theology, and he's trying to work out 
all of these principalities and powers and principles. And I, and I think uh, and I think the relationship uh, that a lot of people have to the internet is 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 properly understood as a religious relationship. I mean, it, the the internet serves as an oracle. Think about that. I mean, think about that the the, the devotion people. Uh, uh, they want to live in its world, like and like you said, they have a sense of it having a life and power of their own that they people want to be in service to, uh, but they also want to appropriate that power. It's very much, it's almost like you know, bald or something from the Old Testament uh, in that fashion. Um, yeah, yeah. And this is in such contrast to to space time, and I think about the the ongoing durable relationships, not just with people you meet on the street, but, but people with whom, let's say, in a church where you, you, share, you share space with them. I mean, the church is called a body. It's, it's the body of Christ. And, you know, you perform rituals together, you sing together, and there's something in that, in that singing that, that changes us. And, there's something in the physical contact that 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 holds us down, whereas in this strange space, um, it's just this hyper. It's so ephemeral. It just it just blows away. Rebel Wisdom had a very interesting campfire session on the psycho spiritual legacy of the Beatles, and Anderson Todd, who has spoken with John Verveke a number of times, he's a neo Jungian. And uh, he and and Eric Davis, I thought, I found I found the video very interesting because the Beatles, of course, were were part of this dramatic transformation, which in the video issues such as decadence and stalling came up. Um, I guess the a good place to start is why is this still relevant? I, it was fascinating. Like there's a couple of things that came up as I was doing the research for this, one of which is it's now longer since the get back sessions. They were in 1969 between now and then than it was between then and the end of the first world war. So it's over 50, which is an astonishing thing if you kind of think about it. And yet this. And, and later on in this video, they'll talk about has the culture stalled? And 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 I very much remend, remembered Ross Douthat's book on decadent, decadence, an excellent book. And just looking at those time frames and and thinking about how you know now they've done this eight-hour documentary of here for you know not unseen footage of the Beatles, and I haven't watched it eight hours. That's even a lot for me. But part of what goes on in there is 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 already the Beatles knew that they were being watched and being recorded, and um, that that this churn of images. Oh, I'm into the Beatles. Now I'm into the Stones. Now I'm into the Who. Now I'm into Kansas. Now I'm into Huey Lewis. The Power of Love. Right, Luke. Now I'm into, now I'm into, now I'm into, now I'm into. We're just, we just live our lives churning, 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 churning. Something very modern about them. What is it about the Beatles in particular that still grabs us so many years on? Anderson, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, I can jump in. So, I mean, I think it's an intersection of a, of a few things. You know, um, one is, of course, that they were, um, tre tremendously creatively and technically innovative. So, you know, even where they didn't necessarily sort of originate a technique, you know, they were borrowing it from perhaps earlier musical traditions or people had, you know, um, done certain things technically, like the degree of technical innovations, which they brought into music and pushed the edges of the technology really opened up um, a field. Uh, and the sort of breadth of places that they cribbed styles from and then fluidly meshed those things together really I'm not sure that it's we've seen the like since. I mean, you know, we had, you know, an opportunity in the Beatles to sort of see the creative production over almost a decade of a group of individuals who individually probably were among the best songwriters uh, who have come along in a few centuries. So to watch them creatively, it's, you know, it's bound to make a mark. But the other aspect of it, I think, is a question somewhat of cultural timing, you know, uh, partly 
by dint of their sort of role as cultural amplifiers for certain sorts of trends and things, but also because they had a, a nose for stuff, they seemed to sort of sniff out the zeitgeist of the of the 60s, you know, and in each of its sort of progressive steps. And as they sort of embodied and amplified that, you know, the... Then I talked in my Audrey Assad video about, you know, musicians and artists sort of being like sailboats and they just they just pick up the winds and and they embody it sense of time um, you had mentioned when we spoke earlier david this idea that they were sort of avatars in a sense of the 60s and i think that this idea that they were um very much kind of riding a cultural wave but simultaneously uh embodying it in some important way for people um really lifted them out of the status of being pop icons and very rapidly pulled them into the sort of territory that's normally reserved frankly for sort of religious movements that really grabbed me um the status of being being it in some important way for people um really lifted them out of the status of being pop icons and very rapidly pulled them into the sort of territory that's normally reserved frankly for sort of religious movements tom holland when i spoke to him talked about you know one of the next books he wants to write is on his idea that the 60s might at some point be regarded as much of a watershed as the as the 15 tens and 20s which of course were the period of the reformation and and the beatles becoming i don't think they quite hit that but what 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 is the difference between a pop icon and a almost a religious figure it has to do with the 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 capacity to 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 fully colonize to become the the narratives that we live through the person peterson was talking to is is um agnes fletcher and the idea of narrative and how we how this how this this i think in many ways is such a deep operating system for us that this is how we manage the times this is how we manage to 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 get the world uh, peterson had peter had some had some great things in here um, objection in, in some sense, and I think it's very tightly associated with this discussion that we engaged in a little bit about the particular versus the absolute. And so, you, you know, your objection is, and, and, and it's the <clears throat> Mircea Eliade, great historian of religion, great storyteller, he talked about Deus abscondus. So we have this idea from Nietzsche, let's say, of the death of God. Now, Eliade, and, and he isn't saying this in reference to Nietzsche, said that one of the problems that religious systems across time faced was Deus abscondus, the disappearing God. And his proposition was, as you move towards a universal absolute, the absolute gets so departicularized that no one knows how to embody it and it loses all emotional connection. The Catholics solve this problem to some degree with the saints, right? Because they're quasi deities in some sense that, that and, and they're very diverse in their behaviors. But this Deus abscondus problem, according to Iliada, has plagued humanity forever. We, we abstract out these universal ideals, but they become so abstract that they no longer have any grip, right? They lose their narrative grip. And so you're your objection, uh, and forgive me if I've got this wrong, is that you have to be careful about stressing the absolute to too great a degree because you miss the advantages of the particular. But we could say, I think the way to solve that is to go back to the idea of, of this nesting of stories, right? Is that you want to rely on the particular because it provides you with specific instructions about how to act here and now. But when it and and you need to you always live in the particular but when we're when we're living through these black mirrors there there's a particularity in here but not not anywhere near as rich as the particularity even in this messy office that I'm sitting in and and it all has to it all has to be tied together
it fails, you refer to a level below that that's more abstract to, to drop a new set of particulars. And so the unions are investigating the base, which it would be. Now, see, because I would say an objection to your objection is, no, we have this problem of particularity because we have our individual personalities and there are particular problems we have to solve. But we have to unify our behavior under some set of abstractions because otherwise we can't exist socially and cooperatively, right, without a standard set of values and mores, and we're disintegrated internally. So we need to solve the problem of particularity and universality simultaneously. And so I, I wouldn't throw out the universality end of it because it isn't in contradiction to that. It's, it, the nesting solves that problem. Well, look, I agree. So first of all, um, anyone who knows... That wasn't exactly the clip I wanted, but it was a good one. So here we are in the churn. And I, I noticed that part of the reason I... And I'm sorry, I don't have anywhere near as many rando slots. I continue to get emails and people asking. And I, tr I try to manage that. I try to keep all of the things balanced. But I, I noticed that even, even once I have a Zoom conversation for an hour or or even enough back and forth on Twitter, something starts to grow. If you, if you travel into the wilderness and especially rocky places, you'll see sometimes, you know, even in Yosemite, these, these, these magnificent granite cliffs and, you know, a tree starts growing out of it and you think, do, do, do you have enough soil? And in some ways, we're, we're looking to have soil to slow down the churn so that we're not just cycling through, 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 losing each other, just, just, just passing away and having our place remember us no more. So there's just a few thoughts on the churn and some of the stuff that I've been thinking about and looking at. Uh, leave a comment. Let me know what you think.